été let the folks in. Oh, I see. Here they come. Uh. Well, kia ora, everybody. Uh, John Holt here. Great to have you here. I can see a few people joining and hopefully they can um, see us and, and log in where I'm using Zoom for the first time for webinars after moving from Crowdcast. It is my pleasure. With a slight delay, to welcome Rebecca Brian Pan all the way. Are you in San Francisco today, Rebecca? I am, yeah. I'm in Trellis, previously known as Kovo. I think we should talk about that at some stage as well because that's a, that's a journey <laughs> in itself. So, um, so to give the folks joining us uh, some context, um, Rebecca and I have known each other for, for many, many years. And um, we were very fortunate to, uh, when we were looking at landing pad and changing up our offering in San Francisco to find um, uh, Rebecca's uh, co-working space, which was super cool. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that and, and that journey as well, because um, Rebecca's joining us um, through that connection, but also as a founder uh, in that space and a big proponent as well of community and those who know me and, and what's come before us in uh, Territory 3 and, and Landing Pad will know how important um, we feel that is. And then there's a really cool shift uh, going on, I guess, for you around impact, um, which we're keen to talk about as well and just get your take on. Um, so great to have you here. Um, maybe I can hand the floor to you to give us a little one minute of, of who you are and what you uh, what's important to you. And then uh, I've got a bunch of questions for you and I'm sure our audience probably has a few too. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's always everything you guys have have touched, I feel like is, is always with the right intention and a lot of intelligence. So I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, my background is in co-working. I've been in the co-working world pretty much since it began. I've been in the world since 2009, started my first space. Um, it's called Next Space. It was a, an early leader and uh, left that in 2014 to start my own label called Kovo, which we did shut down during COVID, having a company called Kovo yeah. during a pandemic called COVID is a, it's a challenge. <laughs> uh, and we spun up Trellis, which is our latest incarnation of of community-based co-working with a huge emphasis on um, inclusion, diversity, and equity. We have a, our whole founding team is female, queer, or people of color. Um, so we're really, really leaning hard into making sure people have a fair shake in the world. Very cool. Very cool. And um, you know that that journey in itself, in terms of looking at a market and looking at San Francisco, because of course, this is quite a weird conversation because, you know, only a year or so ago, I would see you every few months and we would have a chat over a cup of coffee or just in passing in the space in Trellis, uh, formerly Covo. I mean, it's um, always over three beers. Oh, wow. Well, okay. Three, three beers, maybe, but they're American <laughs> beers. So there's different, different yeah. sort of scale there, but it's, um, it would be really cool just to get your take on I mean, you know, here's this world where most of our community we're engaging in some shape or form of Silicon Valley, San Francisco. Obviously, that started to change in a good way in terms of other places. I know you have a view on other yeah. places and hotspots in the US um, that you've seen through your own research for co-working around, you know, where startup communities and that sort of acceptance are going to. But what's the vibe in San Francisco? You know, what does it look like today? Um, you know, what are your thoughts about where it's headed um, as things, hopefully, and I'm going to get your view on this, obviously, are, are sort of coming back to a little bit less of a stressed situation. Yeah, man, it's been such a roller coaster. Um, Pre-pandemic, it felt like things were really flying. Um, in in almost, almost going too fast, um, it started to feel like people were just throwing money at 
at everything and it was the environment was feeling really kind of bro-y and and not very kind um but lots of people were making a lot of money um including us so that was nice <laughs> uh and then the pandemic so many people have left san francisco seen record numbers of people leave and that was starting to happen before because it was getting it was just getting more and more and more expensive and kind of losing some of its soul. Um, so we were seeing a lot of the a lot of people leaving the primary cities like San Francisco, New York, Chicago, LA, and moving to more secondary cities like Austin is blowing up, Seattle is blowing up, Denver is blowing up. And now those cities are, and the pandemic has pushed this further, um, people are moving out to more tertiary areas. So we had a whole lot of friends move to Bend, Oregon, which is not big. I think there's like 100,000 people. Yeah. Um, and for here, that's just, it's a, it's a town feel, you know, it has that kind of town feel. So that's kind of the, the nationwide shift that we've been seeing. Um, but more recently, as San Francisco is doing a really, really good job on vaccination, everyone in, we now have a vaccination requirement at Trellis. Everyone is 100% vaccinated plus two weeks. Um, and the whole city is opening up on June 15th. So there will be no masks required indoors if you're vaccinated, no distancing requirement, no capacity limitations. So we're expect and we and you can feel it like even at trellis, things are really ramping up um, in a way that they haven't for 15 months. So there's a lot of stuff happening, but there's also a lot of stuff that's closed permanently. And then on the flip side, there's like three or 4,000 new outdoor dining um, things that they've done these, like they're called parklets where they would take the parking spaces right in front of the restaurant and, and design and have like a roof and walls, but no fronts so that there's really good airflow, oh, heating cool. lamps, lighting. And it's just like thousands in the city. So there's all these districts now like Valencia and the Castro that have like it's more vibrant than it has ever been because now it's not only you know you go in the door and and it's interior now it's like on the street and they're all designed in really cute ways so that's what we're that's like kind of the latest that we're seeing that there's there's a lot of vibrancy coming back um especially where there are a lot of restaurants where it's fully offices it's like still really weird and the big companies are everyone's trying to figure out their like workplace strategy. Do people come back to the office? Is it fully remote? Apple wants everybody back in the office. Salesforce is fully remote. And then everybody else is somewhere in the middle. Facebook, is like coming back, you can volunteer to be part of the first 10% back. And they're gonna have like a really limited capacity. And that's starting, I think that started this month. So it's, it's kind of a a slow re-entry of of the big tech players. Yeah, interesting. And I had a couple of questions when I was speaking to some folks that, that knew we were going to do this and, and um, folks who are on the call online, um, we're using Zoom. You're probably familiar with the format. You can put your hand up and, and ask questions. We want to make this as interactive as we can. Um, but there's also a bunch of folks who couldn't make it today. And one of the big questions uh, that they had about trying to get to know um, some of them, you know, still trying to work out their initial US entry strategy and some of them trying to reboot it after sort of, you know, things are starting yeah. to settle a bit. The talent side of things, I'm sort of, I'm interested in your thoughts, you know, you're seeing your space sort of come back to life and so forth. But I mean, is there still this sort of really tough and highly aggressive demand for talent? What are your sort of feelings on, on that, particularly around for us, 
uh, Kiwis, I guess, we're looking for those sort of biz dev, you know, market development, market growth sort of people. That's a really good question. My, my sense is it really depends if it is, if it's roles that are local or roles that can be remote. Because right now with this whole shift to remote, there's so much more opportunity for people that are not here. Um, people that are here, everyone I know who's hiring is having a hard time, whether it's for entry level, all of like the hospitality and food service. Um, the, the, the government is still doing a stimulus bonus. So um, entry level workers, every, everyone's getting an extra like $300 a week for on their unemployment which for food service workers is a lot. It's a pretty high percentage. So a lot of people are saying like, why, why would I be a barista when I make more playing yep. video games at home? Mm. Which is a fair point, a fair question. Um, so there's a lot of difficulty hiring and, and kind of staffing back up for restaurants and hospitality. Um, the more skilled biz dev, sales, tech, I think that it's also hard to find people. Um, what we are seeing is that there's kind of like a middle where there's, there's almost like a glut of talent. Um, but at the, at the ends, I think it is a challenge unless you're able to do completely remote which then, you know, the world's your oyster. Yeah, which is interesting for us, obviously, because we're a long, long way away and um, there's potential opportunities for us to actually sort of capture that in this, I don't know what you'd call it, mid-space maybe, where we're still not flying or connecting with each other in person, but people are rebuilding their teams and they are remote and they are global. So it's kind of an interesting challenge for us, which, um, which brings me into community because I'm very... Um, keen to get your take on where you see that now as a I guess as a as a sort of discipline as an element of business because full disclosure folks you know when we um uh, when Chan Simpson was running uh the landing pad and we, we 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 found Rebecca and her team and moved in um we had a sense of community but I think um you were probably one of the first kindred souls who talked uh in the same words and, and terminology about understanding, I guess, from your background, just um, how important that is to build something with, you know, with lifetime value and legacy, but also um, uh, how you sort of embrace it. So keen to hear your thoughts on community in general, but also just um, in this new age, um, you know, we're calling it this third territory now with all these new sort of market conditions. Love yeah. to hear your thoughts on community and, and where you see it going and how important it is. Well, at a, at a very primal level, we are social creatures and being isolated over the past 15 months, I think has been, has been really traumatizing globally. It's been really great in some ways, you know, like less commute time, people have more time for family and those kind of, and, you know, self-care practices and meditation and I think people are sleeping more and better and exercising either more or less. But from a community standpoint, we're not really built for isolation. But in the current environment, especially with everybody being able to work remote, um, we're creating an environment that is very solitary. So what, what I'm seeing and the consulting that I'm doing with um, non the nonprofit that, um, that I'm supporting as well as in, in helping them think about their, their return to the workplace strategy or what they want their workplace strategy to look like, as well as research from a lot of different, the, some of the biggest companies I think what we're what we're gonna see is a big shift in 
how people are working and what what they're doing when they're together. I think working in an office, even though we are social creatures, you can be really productive alone. And that's that's now been like, there was a thinking that that wasn't feasible or that wasn't possible, but now through technology and everybody's like pimped out their home office and has have their multiple screens, people are 2% more productive overall working remotely or working from home. Um, but a lot of people's mental health is suffering. Yeah. So what I, what I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of is people is teams coming together for two days a week, three days a week, one week a month, like different, different models for, um, in-person work. And that in-person work will be collaboration, whiteboarding, um, as well as kind of like co-working to support those spontaneous water cooler conversations and learnings that you didn't, things you didn't know you had in common, or like there's a lot of spontaneous acceleration that happens when you're in person that we've completely missed out on because we're remote, we have an agenda, we stick to the agenda, it's, you know, or we're just doing a remote happy hour and we're trying to connect, but we're still like, it's not the same. So that's what, I, that's what I, I think is gonna be, I think when people get together, it's gonna be more social and, but people are going to capitalize on both the time they're together and the time that they're home. I think we saved like 60, million hours in commute time or something in the US alone over the over the course of the pandemic. That's significant. A lot of hours that people are not driving, stuck in traffic, spending money. So I think this shift is is here, but community is going to be really important as it always has been, but even even more so now that people have the flexibility to choose. And a lot of emissions reduced as well, right? A lot of what? Emissions, you know, all those cars driving backwards. Yeah. And forwards. Yeah. Yeah, that was very which, cool. Which sort of brings me on to um, something that I'm really interested in, in your take on. Um, and we're starting to see this as a trend from a lot of our um, American community members is, is just around all this... Um, you know, the, the logical and quite understandable concerns and issues around environment and social, but um, in the US, I guess, um, some of us here kind of understand it, but um, we, we have a different term, but widely known as ESG, so, you know, environment, social governance. Um, and just, um, I know you've got a passion for impact and for, you know, the, the work around those things, but if you're a company sort of building out, looking for, you know, this adjustment of your, you um, uh, your company for the new age, you know, going back into the US market harder as we've sort of developed things. It feels to me and um, that the ESG side, the the impact side, that sort of level of consciousness at any level, whether you're sort of pitching startup, you know, VCs obviously making very defined um, uh, promotions and, and, and positions on their sites uh, about their focus and awareness and action around ESG. Where do you sort of see that? And if you were a startup or a company coming in from New Zealand, how um, potentially would you be changing or addressing that side of, of life and business in, in the US now that it seems like it's really accelerating as an important factor? I think it is accelerating, which is great. I think you, we still have the kind of... Um, Republican white complaining Donald Trump version of the United States um, that is that is shrinking, although it's very loud. So I think we're kind of in the final death throes and it's I think it's gonna take a long time, but I think we're seeing those kind of final death throes of that kind of environment and what we're seeing more of, although it doesn't get as much press because it's not as provocative, I guess, 
is the, the focus on impact. Um, so I think that kind of triple bottom line of people, planet, profit is like with B Corps and um, impact investing and the new models that are coming out um, to really to really support that. I think that's a great place to be and is definitely gaining traction. Do you think there's any change in terms of having to, let's just say you're not actually in that space, but you are, you know, just looking to make sure you've, you know, I guess has the pitch deck changed, do you think, if you were coming in here as a, as a new founder to actually add a slide or incorporate some sort of recognition of something that you would never have, you know, previously, it's just all been about, you know, the, the numbers, the big upwards into the right curve and, and, you know, how you're going to sort of dominate your market. I think it's worthwhile. I don't think it's mainstream yet right. for, for um, like more traditional VC funding, but all of the accelerators and incubators, they, everybody wants to know that you're the people to do it. You're doing something that's gonna make money, but also you're doing something that the world needs. So I, I do think it is worth addressing and because it, it's, it's just kind of gonna, you know, tip you over the edge. And if they don't care, they don't care. <laughs> but, I, yeah. but I do think that, that interest in, in sustainability is, it's, it's skyrocketing, which is great. We need that. We need that to happen. Yeah, yeah, totally. We've got a um, question from the audience, Rebecca. In fact, someone, uh, Ryan Marshall. Uh, g'day, Ryan. Um, and his question is, with many people leaving San Francisco, has it affected rents and general affordability in any meaningful way? And, and I have to add his other comment, which is, as a long-time COVO, now Trellis resident, wanted to say thanks for such a great experience at a wonderful place and community to work in. So thanks for that, Ryan. And that's Ryan's question. Where's, where's the living sort of standard stuff at? Oh, thanks, Ryan. We, we saw a big drop in in um, prices for rentals, everything went down about a thousand dollars. So things were, God, it's so expensive here. <laughs> um, we were seeing like a two bedroom that was 4,200 um, go down to about 3,200. So this is monthly, monthly figures US dollars. Monthly figures US dollars. Um, however, that has already reversed. Um, it, I don't think it's quite back up to pre-pandemic rates, but it's not where it's not where it was. Um, it's now like for that same what was forty two hundred and went down to thirty two hundred is now like 3,900. So it's, it's bounced back pretty quickly. Um, and something that, we've, something that we've always seen in San Francisco, when there's something like the recession in 2008, San Francisco will go down a little bit or flatline, um, but it, it's, the it's the first to bounce back. So there's still a ton of places in the United States that are, that are struggling um, but San Francisco tends to be, tends to be resilient, even though it get, it gets hit when these things happen pretty hard. So we missed the window basically. Yeah. Um, but there is a lot more, there's a ton of construction happening here right now. Tons and tons and tons of, of multi-use and residential. So there's many thousands of units that are coming on line, as well as a lot of the big corporations are working on reducing their footprint. So there's a lot of office space available. Um, so you should still come, but it is yeah. expensive. <laughs> Good plug. I say let's switch, um, switch gears to Rebecca, the founder. And um, I remember when we came to the US for the first time looking 
to try and create this landing pad, um, you know, pre-community thoughts, just literally find the space. Um, really challenging uh, from a real estate point of view, but then in terms of this idea of someone just renting a desk, um, it was still pretty new, right? And, and we actually only came across two organisations. One was NetSpace, uh, which you were obviously involved in, and the other was Plug and Play. So it was a very sort of new solution to a, a problem that sort of, um, you know, was in its early days. So I'm, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts just as a founder about sort of reversing from today and Trellis and all the things that you've sort of learned and incorporated in that from a business point of view and a um, community point of view versus you know where you started and what the problem was he was solving in those next space because if i get it right it was i think there was only like three or four spaces in san francisco of any scale that were, that were doing that back in uh 2010 11. yeah yeah when we when we launched next space in san francisco in may of 2010 it was the fourth in the bay area fourth co-working and and our biggest challenge in those early days was we had a sandwich board outside our front door and it said working alone sucks and um come co-work and people would call up to on the call box and be like working alone does suck what are you do what what do you what are you why are you telling me that <laughs> like what are you doing about it and um and they would come up and just so education about what co-working was, was, you know, the word had only been coined a few years earlier. So most people were just, they only knew Regis or plug and play if they knew any sort of third workplace at all. And we would get a lot of, a lot of shit around like, why would I pay for that? I have a home office. Why would I pay for that? I can sit in Starbucks. Why would I pay for that? Um, so, so initially our biggest challenge was just kind of educating the market on what co-working was, why it was valuable, why it was different than working from home or from working from Starbucks. Um, and it attracted tech it attracted tech it attracted men they were almost all white um and that was frustrating for me as a as a female founder of jewish origin and where i'm like where is there's no diversity here um and this and that, and so when we five years later when we launched kovo it was with a much more intentional um, focus on people of color and the LGBTQ community and um, supporting entrepreneurs regardless of origin and creed and um, and color and we're just like so we started doing work with um, I can't remember the the acronym but it was like black female trans entrepreneurs focused on the cannabis industry <laughs> a little bit niche -y. very niche it was just get like fully all the intersections um but that was those were the sorts of groups that we were like let's let's create a safe place for you to do your best work um and and that was that was super fulfilling and we're, we're we're furthering that with trellis of kind of creating a, a support infrastructure for entrepreneurs um and i've always thought about business as like i don't know i think it's 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 easy to do business like an asshole. It's harder to do business looking at how do we really 
hear everybody, meet them where they are and find win-win opportunities for the community, the humans involved, the end customer, the planet. Um, but it's so much more satisfying. So imagine it would be slower though, is it right? In terms of being intentional about what you don't want in the in the environment and the culture and, and having to say no a lot to stuff that was you know, organizations and potential customers that are just gonna just gonna give you some cash. Yes and no. I think you find your people mm. by going by going deep as opposed to trying to go wide and appeal to everyone. Um, so it, it kind of makes marketing easier, but it does limit it. Your, it does it can limit your market. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's the perennial challenge of anything, you know, software, you know, there's a big problem to solve, but that's not actually the challenge. It's like finding the tribe that's, you know, most accepting of the way you solve that problem and then diving deep into that and finding more and more of them because there's, you know, dozens of email systems and dozens of task management and all that sort of stuff for exactly that reason. Mm -hmm. I think um, I'm keen to sort of get your thoughts around that sort of founder journey because, you know, um, well, gosh, you know, it's pretty obvious with COVID and so forth, it's been lots of ups and downs for you. From a business point of view but how do you how do you manage that and which are the ones that you that you kind of the challenges in business that you kind of just you know they they, they wash off and it's just part of doing things and which ones kind of keep you up at night and sort of have been most challenging to to manage your um sanity as a founder mm. i think the the one that used to really bother me was the gender um when we first started Covo, I was CEO and my two co-founders were uh, my COO and my CTO, and they were both male. And at one point, Dan, my COO, he was like, we would be in all these meetings where what I said would just, just not really be heard or or somebody would he, like say it again and then it would be heard. And it was, and at one point Dan was like, so you taught me everything I know about coworking and you've taught me how to talk about it. Is it my job to just say the same thing that you say out of a man face? It was so frustrating. And I was like, yeah, I think it is like early on. I was like, I, yeah, I, I'll teach you what you need to know. And then you say the words because they are heard better when they come out of your face. And then a few, a few years went by and, and we kind of revisited the conversation and I, and I did, I've done a lot of reading and a lot of research around like, how do you, how do you best support the quieter voices or the, the people that don't have a voice? And it is, um, and I, I went back to Dan and I was like, okay, your job is actually not to just repeat what I say out of a man face. Your job is to amplify what I say. So you need, you need to be my hype man, basically. You need to support like, oh, that was, you know, like just support the conversation so that I do get the credit for what I'm saying. Um, and he was like, yeah, cool, I can do that. Let's do that. And that that has been a really profound shift in that piece. But I have emails of like, just, you know, when you get on an email thread that you're not supposed to, <laughs> I have like email threads from, from like, C-suite people of companies that you've heard of referring to me as like, oh, that woman, do I have to look out for that woman? And um, and I am not an aggressive founder. I'm not a like, but I just am assertive. So, so that was something that at this point is kind of like, it just, it washes off. Um, but something that that does really get under my skin still to this day or, or like is something that 
I, I think about a lot is how important a company's culture is to its longevity, to its impact in the world, to its profit margin. And I see so many companies that have a mentality of they're just gonna, it's kind of like the Tesla mentality of if you can hack it, you can make it. And if you can't hack it, we're going to burn you out and you, you can, you can leave and go do something else. Um, and I think that that mentality is such a waste of energy. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's so prevalent, especially in, in tech, um, where, for example, a friend of mine was at Cruise, which is a driverless car company, and he got super burnt out and he moved over to, um, actually, I probably shouldn't tell you where he is now because he's still really unhappy because it's the same mentality of like no work-life balance. They just crush all of the souls. Um, and it's it's a very like uh, growy and stoic just kind of bullshit uh culture and environment at least that's my that's my perspective so that's something that bothers me i think there's so much if you can't bring your whole self to the office if you're if you don't have the resources to actually get your job done like we just we don't need to run in this sort of hamster wheel that everybody seem or a lot of companies still seem to seem to feel like they need to, even though it's proven to be less productive and burn people out faster. And you spend so much money recruiting because you keep losing your people. Yeah. And I look, I mean, I sort of can attest to, um, uh, well, obviously, you know, you've expressed your frustration, but you know, certainly for us in terms of looking for a solution back in the, the landing pad days, you know, we, we looked at um, the big one with the two W's. I could say it, I think, anyway, you know, the, like the new work side of things. And then and then the Kobo now trellis um, side and just walking into the environment in terms of even what was front and centre as you walk through the doors gave you a pretty clear impression of um, the, the, the value proposition of, you know, the way that your space was set up and, and just even the the kind of the mix of, of people and the vibe and the and the, and the sort of the, the connections and the sort of the, the the ambience that was going on so it's very easy to pick isn't it in terms of that sort of cultural and sort of focusing on things but probably really difficult to sort of design and maintain would that be would that be fair in terms of actually staying sort of because I know you and um uh, your folks, you know, were just quietly always sort of in the background, just sort of working around, chatting to folks. There was never really any um, conscious presence, but I, I know there was a lot of work going on within the community and the folks that were there to make sure their experience was good. I think it does. I mean, there's definitely, we wanted a high touch environment. And so we created a space that would support enough staff to provide that. So having the coffee shop, having the bar, having the event space all under one roof meant that we could kind of like, everybody is working towards building that warm, welcoming uh, environment. And we, we made sure in our, in our marketing and in our outreach to seek out you know, women and people of color and, and, and encourage um, those sorts of people and conversations to, so that it would feel like you hear different accents, you see different colors, just different ages, there's different, we had one woman, which was really cool. She came up to us, she was a longtime member and she was like, your staff is all really small. You're all skinny people. And as somebody who is obese, I own it and I really appreciate that all of your furniture, I don't have to squish myself into it. You've like, I don't know how you designed it and if you did it intentionally, but most places I don't fit and I fit here and I really appreciate that you've created a comfortable space for people that are 
differently abled also. Yeah, very cool. And the other thing too, you know, when you walked into to Trellis, or probably still walking today, I haven't been there for a while, sadly, um, you know, you and your team always in that front right hand sort of uh, stall set if you were working, just like, you know, right out in front of the community, literally as you walked in the door, which again, when we sort of looked at spaces, you just, you know, there was a manager or somebody who was definitely not sort of front and center as you, as you walked in. So I'm interested in your thoughts, just again, from sort of founder insights around that whole, you know, the L word, you know, leadership and how you actually, you know, what, what you've learned about that from next space through to today and, and your thoughts on how you approach actually leading out, you know, something like that. My thoughts on leadership? Yeah. I think you, so everything comes from the top, right? Like the culture. And if you have an unlimited pay, PTO policy, but you never take vacation, it's not real. You're just telling people like, yeah, you have a limited vacation. <laughs> you can't go anywhere, you know? So <laughs> Sounds good. It sounds good. And, and, and a lot of companies have it as like a perk, but it's a, it's a fake perk. Um, so I've worked really hard to lead from a place of authentically, like, who am I and, and how do I, and like, how do I know who you are? How do I really listen to you? When we do our weekly all teams, the first thing we do is we have a check-in each person has like 30 to 60 seconds to be like, how are you from, and we, we even quantify it like from a scale of one to 10, one being worst day of your life, 10 being, you know, just you're flying high. Um, and then a couple sentences about why. Uh, and with the, with the goal of bringing your whole self to the office. And also if you're usually an eight and you're a four, you know, it gives us some insight into like, you know, how do, how do we give you that extra little bit of support? And, and it creates a space to be honest and vulnerable and, and maybe you slept really badly, or maybe you had to put your cat down, or maybe your meds, changed and while there's so many things that you would be like I'm not gonna talk about that at work like that's that's private stuff like we don't really believe in that we're like what's happening with you I don't care if it's what's happening in your home or with your family or in your job how are you doing as as a as a human uh and so that's kind of that's an example of how I lead and I'll take, I take a lot of vacations and I really encourage everybody to do it. it it's a kind of a, like, you do need to get your job done. You need to get your deliverables delivered, but then take it, take time off. And I really believe in swearing. Swear. <laughs> I think, uh, I think swearing is an important part of my leadership style. <laughs> it's the first time I've heard that one. <laughs> well fuck John <laughs> yeah no I can attest to that and I mean it's just important right at this authenticity thing I think um for us in our community a lot of founders don't really you know there is a lot of I guess what you call the textbook or the powerpoint sort of you know this is how to be an effective leader and um a lot of it it just isn't lived to your point about um, you know, no limited days off, but when the, you know, the, the leader is there sort of 16 hours a day and glaring at people when they're leaving too early. Um, yeah. That isn't really a thing, right? Do you think that's changing um, for the good? You know, you talked about kindness earlier on in terms of a lot of these businesses, a lot of these startups, you know, they raise a lot of money, um, but they also have literally, you know, the investor often sitting over the top of them with a, with a you know, a virtual whip. Um, really sort of demanding, you know, all, all, all blood, sweat um, uh, to, to grow the business. Do you think that's changing a bit? I mean, obviously people want outcomes, they're investing for that reason, but is it, is it changing or where do you think it's at? 
I do think it's changing. And I think it's changing because the science, the money follows the science, right? So you can have an environment where everyone is expected to be there 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and there's now enough, there have been enough studies to show that that's not the best way of hitting your numbers. You know, burnout is just too real. We're not robots. Um, so, so I do think there is more awareness, more companies that are working towards actually providing the resourcing necessary to achieve the objectives and paying attention to that. Um, there's also that, I was just reading a really interesting article about like that, that rushing is a, um, an indicator of a, of a white supremacy mentality of another way of control which isn't actually providing the performance that that companies are looking for. So I do think people's eyes are being open to like happier people are more productive people and you're going to keep them for longer and you're not going to have to re-recruit for them and you're not going to have to pay as much. And it's like, there's so many benefits and we're slowly getting away from this mentality of just like, the grind is, is the way. Mm -hmm. It's also very gender um, connected. So for organizations that are all or primarily male, all are primarily white, you're, you, you still, it's like the older mentality. It's kind of like law firms. You know how law mm -hmm. firms are like the old white guys who just yeah. refuse to use DocuSign or like refuse to get out of their own way. They're still faxing. Yeah. Um, I think this, this kind of concept of work-life balance and, and actually having happy employees um, be more productive it's that same, it's like that same kind of idea. Uh, so when you have boards or teams that have more diversity, have more um, both racial and gender diversity and you know, all the other, all the other intersections, um, those are the companies that are also that are like more woke in that way, but also more woke in the way of actually getting the best work out of their people. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, it ends up in actually the place where everyone wants to be, right? Which is which is just better results, more efficiency, better margins, better productivity. Which is kind of the wacky thing about this this world of sort of pushing up against that. It does take a little bit more time, but only because you've got to re-engineer, you know, the demographic of of what is, you know, as you've said, you know, predominantly still just heavily heavily focused on one area of gender and age and all of those things um, crazy thing for me is that you know i think it's like 70 or 80 percent of females make cons the consumer decisions in the world that's the, the final voice that actually will decide on you know big big ticket items and yet we don't have that representation in most businesses so then yeah. at the table to get inside the heads of, of a consumer it's just you know it's just basic good business but you would have thought but um just there's a lot it. of really intentional double speak yeah there's a lot of you know very intentional keeping keeping all of that stuff down i was just reading a book talking about how like at least in the u.s like the republican party is now the white man's grievance party right and there's just a desire to hold on to power in a way that isn't actually benefiting those trying to hold on to it. Um, but there, it feels like it is. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do in that space. Um, moving to wrap up, 
um, and probably putting you on the spot a little bit, just in terms of what we're talking about, you know, um, a lot of us, you know, as founders are, are looking for companies to aspire to around these things we're talking about, you know, around um, just the approach to, to business, obviously, you know, their product and so forth, but also their culture and how they're, uh, how they're actively sort of changing or just progressing things. So um, big, uh, you know, one that you super admire and one that you, you know, uh, on the opposite end of the scale, what are the, you know, is there a brand or a couple of brands that you think are really kind of leading us out in the space that you've observed anywhere in the world or in your space and, and, and which are the ones that you think are just kind of a million miles away? What a great question. I think Kiva, the the micro donation and uh, micro investment company, I really, really appreciate their their take and how they do things um and how many uh women and people of color i, I believe it's women if it's female founded although don't don't quote me on that i'm pretty sure um just the the millions of small businesses that they have um invested in and supported and so that i think it's just such an incredibly admirable company. Um, a company I am not impressed with our government. <laughs> it's way too general. You're not getting away with that. <laughs> We'd all answer that if we were able to. Um, let's see, who else? I've been really disappointed in Facebook recently. Um, they're the argument of social media platforms of the content isn't their responsibility and their the consequences of that content is not their responsibility they're just the platform is um i think that's really fucked up i think if you if you give a megaphone to somebody you need to be aware of what that megaphone is is saying to hundreds of millions of people um yeah i think you've got a shared uh, obviously new zealand's been doing a lot around supporting just a, a big question mark over the responsibilities of of those big companies with just you know billions of billions of eyeballs and in content which um just just isn't just isn't right that's um it's a fascinating one so look we've um We've come to the end of our hour pretty much. It's been a fantastic. That was fast. I know. We covered a lot of stuff too, and I really appreciate you taking the time. I think um, that that's going to be a really useful um, piece for folks who are sort of slowly um, trying to figure out how to get global again for, for a lot of them. Some have you know, actually done well um, going through the, 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 the uh the pandemic has actually created opportunities for them, but what sort of remains the same is that we just haven't been able to do the physical um, in-person stuff. So it's been great to get that perspective on San Francisco and your journey as a founder. Um, any final thoughts or, or perspective for us Kiwis um, down here in terms of building our businesses out from any aspect that you would like? I Last thing I will say is the idea of the tall poppy is bullshit. Nice. You should do it. Be a tall poppy. Fantastic end point, Rebecca. Thank you so much for joining us and um, enjoy the Thank rest you of your so day. Much. And thanks everyone for joining us as well. Ka kite. Take care.